All right, here we go. Chapter 13 is vibrations and waves. We're going to focus on something called simple harmonic motion. Um, we'll take a look at it. And basically, simple harmonic motion is covers a lot of different territory, a lot of different physics ideas. It's, it's really a huge part of the world, the universe that we live in. Um, but we model it based on the motion of a spring. And so Hooke's Law comes in into play here. <coughs> Remember, the force on a spring is minus kx, where k is a spring constant. The bigger it is, the, the stiffer, the stronger the spring. <clears throat> and x is how far it's either been stretched or compressed away from that equilibrium point, and you have to define x equals zero where the, the hook isn't, sorry, where the spring isn't exerting any force one way or the other. <clears throat> so f is the force on a spring, k is the spring constant, and x is the displacement from your equilibrium, equilibrium position. So you have to define x equals zero at equilibrium or that force, uh, that formula is just no good. So the negative sign just tells us, if you set it equals zero, no matter where you are, if you're in the positive x, it's bringing you back towards zero. If you're in the negative x, it will point towards zero. So that force is always pointing towards the equilibrium position. <clears throat> it's always pointing towards it. Um, the further away you are, the stronger the force um, pointing back to it. We call that a restoring force. If you notice the picture here is um, a young lady with a bow and arrow. Um, her equilibrium position for that bow is when the string isn't pulled, right? And when she pulls on it, there is a force, kx force of some sort, pointing back towards that equilibrium position. <coughs> and it turns out um, a lot of things in the universe <coughs> behave this way, especially atoms. And we seem to be in a world filled with atoms when, when one um, atom pushes against another, the, the electromagnetic force, the stronger you push, the, the more the restoring force, the more it pushes away. And so a lot of things behave like, like springs. <clears throat> so here's our mass spring system. This is the traditional one that we use. We put it on a, <clears throat> a frictionless plane and we disturb it from equilibrium. We move it an x away and there's an f that goes back towards the um, that equilibrium position. Or if we squish the spring, it's feeling a force back towards zero in both cases. When f is at x, when x is zero, f is zero. You know that from looking at it, and we defined our coordinate system that way, right? When the spring isn't compressed or stretched, it shouldn't be exerting a force on anything. <clears throat> so um, this will become difficult when we hang a spring. We're going to create a new equilibrium position where the forces add up to zero. That's our normal. Um, word for equilibrium, right? And so we're going to keep that. It's just now we're going to have gravity in. Here the only force acting in the x direction is the force of the spring. And so when the sum of the forces, that's just the force of the spring equals zero, you're in equilibrium. going to kill me saying equilibrium all this many times. Let's see. <clears throat> um, so if you pull it a distance a, we use the letter a to represent amplitude, um, and release it from rest, if there's no friction, and there's no heat energy lost in the spring, then it will have a potential energy out here, one half kx squared. It all turns into kinetic when it gets to x equals zero, and then compresses again, one half kx squared, and it will go back and forth between a and negative a forever if there's no, um, <coughs> if there's nothing pulling energy from the system. Um, all right. So the force decreases as it goes towards zero, and it's at a minimum at zero, but the velocity is increasing the entire time, right? The it starts at zero, the force is this way, it accelerates in the same direction as the force always. So it's accelerating this way, and the velocity picks up in this direction. When it gets to zero, there's no more acceleration, but there's plenty of velocity. So then it goes this way. Well, now the force is back this way, so is the acceleration. When the accelerations are in opposite directions, you slow down. When they're, when they're in the same direction, you speed up. So speeding up, slowing down. Speeding up, slowing down. Speeding up, right? When it's moving towards the equilibrium position, it's speeding up. When it's moving away, it's slowing down, um, as told to you by the direction of the force. So here we are at equilibrium. The velocity is at a maximum. All of the potential energy is gone now. The spring doesn't have any compression so or stretch. So all of your one half kx squared became one half mv squared. Yes. 
<clears throat> this should all look very familiar. We're all going someplace new, but not quite yet. All right, um, and back the other way. Potential energy is increasing, kinetic energy is decreasing. Down to zero again, and you will get to minus A as long as no energy has been leached from the system. And so we call this an oscillation, back and forth, right? Like an oscillating fan, or like a pendulum here, we'll do the same thing. Notice this pendulum approximates that motion if the, um, if the shadow is the block, right? the shadow of the ball. If you projected the light down from the sky, like a noon, um, the ball would cast a shadow of a pendulum that would look similar to this. It's not quite simple harmonic motion, it's actually a little bit off. We'll talk about that, but it's a decent approximation. <coughs> All right. So if no other forces act, if, and if no heat energy is lost, no sound, no air resistance, in the real world, of course, this would slow down after a while, right? Um, but in the ideal spring situation, then it, it just goes on forever. We call that motion simple harmonic motion. Anything that a restoring force acts on something, um, if it's Hooke's law, we call it simple harmonic motion. You have variants of Hooke's law where you have, say, minus kx squared or minus kx to the third or kx to the minus one or something like that. Well, that would be bad. Um, where you would call it harmonic motion, but it wouldn't be simple. Simple harmonic motion is Hooke's law minus kx doesn't have to be a spring to obey Hooke's law, but there has to be some constant that uh, is a restoring force, right? Proportional to the distance away from that, that equilibrium, equilibrium position. All right. So any periodic motion, including like um, planets moving around, um, a star, um, anything that repeats itself over and over again, you can... <coughs> Describe it with simple harmonic motion by looking at just say its x coordinate or its y coordinate. Um, if you look at the sort of the shadow that a planet um, say you got something going in a circle, it, it leaves a shadow. If you look at just the sign of the thing, it'll give you simple harmonic motion back and forth. So the amplitude, we use the letter capital A for that. Um, that's your furthest away from the equilibrium position in both directions, both positive and negative. Right? In the absence of friction. If there is some friction, you might start at A, but you won't quite get to negative A, and you won't quite get back to A again, and you'll get smaller and smaller. So we're going to define a couple of terms here that are going to be super helpful. <coughs> the first we're going to define is the period, T. Um, it's the time it takes. That's why we use the capital T. It's the time it takes to complete one cycle. Um, this is pretty important, and some people screw this up because it's the time it takes to get back to where you started. So it's not from A to negative A. It's from A back to A. That amount of time is called your period. So it's to go from A to negative A, but then back to A again. The frequency is 1 over the period. Right? How many times per second it does that um, is one over the period. So frequency and period are related that way, and they always will be. We're going to use it for a bunch of different topics, for light and all kinds of cool things and sound. But frequency is always going to be one over the period. That's worth putting in big letters somewhere in your notebook. Super important. <clears throat> they are reciprocals of each other. So if you know the period, one um, frequency is one over the period, and period is one over the frequency. You could that goes back and forth either way. <clears throat> so if the only force on it is minus kx, <coughs> the sum of the forces is m times a in Newton's law. So you get this equation here. The acceleration is minus kx divided by m. So there is a function um, for acceleration as a, as a function of position there, right? Notice the acceleration is not constant. So all of the formulas that we learned about uniform motion um, don't apply. All of those kinematic formulas, one half ax squared or whatever, or one, uh, x is one half at squared. None of that works. You can't use any of it. We have to use a totally different formula. We have to solve this equation differently because a is constantly changing. A is never the same, right? It's constantly changing. It's, it's a function of position. So if you're at a certain position, you get a certain acceleration. So if your position is zero, that's your minimum acceleration, right? All right. <clears throat> We're going to store energy <coughs> in this spring. 
Elastic potential energy, uh, this should look familiar. The potential energy of a spring is one half kx squared. All right. Um, the period for our spring, um, this is a funky little formula, which um, you may see derived someday. Um, two pi times the square root of m over k. m is the mass of our block. Remember, this is this is a block on a spring. There are lots of analogs to this, and you'll get slightly different formulas for the position. But this the spring moving back and forth with no, nothing else going on. The period is m over k. Take the square root, multiplied by 2 pi. That's the total amount of time required to come back to its starting position. k is the spring constant, m is the mass. Right? So the frequency is 1 over that. That's pretty easy to do. Worth writing both down. Save yourselves a few seconds on the test, right? Um, you measure frequency in something called Hertz. Um, we use a capital H, lowercase z to symbolize that. It's the amount of times per second something happens. So if something hits you in the arm 60 times in one second, that's 60 Hertz. It's a lot of Hertz. Okay. <clears throat> um, Angular frequency is something a little bit different. If you were to take this, if you've got the spring going back and forth, you can um, make it into a rotational analogy or back and forth. So if something is moving in a circular pattern, it'll create a shadow on the x-axis that behaves in, in um, this simple harmonic motion way. And so we say the angular frequency, whether it's moving in a circle or not, we still define an angular frequency of 2 pi f or just the square root of k over m. Both of those you need to know and have written down. You'll see that both ways. Okay. An angular frequency is going to, something that's going to come back a lot. It has a lot to do with quantum mechanics and with light. <coughs> so we know the frequency is the number of cycles per second. The angular frequency would be the number of radians per second. So it's just a rotational analogy of that linear motion, or vice versa. So here, we've got object at point P going in a circle, right? If you look at its x-coordinate, right, at any given time, it's going to go back and forth just like that spring, right, where your amplitude is going to be the radius, and it's going to behave in that simple harmonic motion way. When we do this, it gives us the um, ability to write a formula for the position velocity and acceleration of an object that's in simple harmonic motion. Um, a cosine omega t is your position vector at any given time, right? This is only true if you start the clock um, when the amplitude is a, when you stretch it out to a, you've got your x position is here when you start the clock. Otherwise you end up with some phase angle in there, you have plus some angle phi or something. Um, those of you who are <coughs> Just doing pre-calc, um, this will this will be a little bit of work. Um, feel free to come see me, talk to me. We can practice it some more. So x is your position at time t, but just put a zero in for t, right? When your cosine of zero is one, and you get x equals a. So think about put some put some practice numbers in there, right? Um, to see where the thing is. So when when the angular when t equals the angular frequency, you've gone around once, right? That's how many radians per second you should come back to, back to um, that place. You should get a two pi there. The cosine of two pi is also one, and you come back to a again. But this should keep going. This may, whatever t in the future you want to put in there, you can get. Just be careful. Omega is in radians, right? Not in degrees. It's not looking for three sixty. We're looking for two pi. So, take a look at um, this graphical representation. We get a cosine wave, right? When x equals zero, or when t equals zero, we're at the x equals a. Um, a quarter of a period later, we're back at the origin. Half a period, we're at minus a. Three quarters of our period, we're at back at zero. And then a whole period later, we, for the first time, come back to where we started at x equals a. Right? And that'll keep repeating itself. So the velocity does the opposite, right? It makes a very similar looking graph. Now its, its magnitude is not on the same scale as x. It doesn't have the same units as x, but it is um, a sine wave. 
And then when we come back to the acceleration, the acceleration is a cosine wave again, but notice it's shifted so that you're at um, the negative acceleration when you're at A, the acceleration is pointed back towards the origin, right? Minus kx. <coughs> so a quick sketch of those in your notebook would not hurt you any. So here we go. So there's our x equal, there's our x formula. Um, if you know any calculus, velocity is the derivative of your position, and that's what you get. Um, minus a omega times sine of omega t. Notice this stuff, the omega t is inside the cosine function, and this omega t is inside the sine function. And then you take the next derivative of that, and you get a cosine again, um, negative a omega squared. And this omega t is still inside that formula. Um, don't let this frighten you too badly. We may need to put some numbers in the calculator, and we may need to use radians. And we may need to practice it a little bit, but... Um, most of your, your um, testing of this will be qualitative. Not a whole lot of numbers being thrown in there. Mostly you're going to be looking at, can you see it going back and forth? Do you know what the position is when the velocity is maximum? That sort of thing. And we already, we already wrote that down, but super important. That's still omega. This is the omega here. This is omega here. They're both the same omega. A is the amplitude. <coughs> and omega is still square root of k over m. 